Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to Fallen London. Today we are going to be looking at the exceptional story for August, The Shallows. Uh, in a previously quiet corner of Jekyll Gardens, two off-duty domestic staff sit on tea crates playing chess. This seems like it's going to be a very interesting story, so yet again, I will always say this at the start of every single exceptional story. If you want to play this for yourself, go and support the game and get an exceptional, exceptional friendship. It's definitely worth the price and it's always better to play these yourself than watch some idiot on the internet do it for you. So, without further ado, let's set off. The game, however, has attracted a gaggle of well-heeled onlookers. The board is stained and the carving of the pieces rather crude, but the caliber of play is very high. Whispers and wagers pass through the audience. Oh, it looks like we can either bet on the impetus of Butler. He plays black, dashing off moves with a flick of the fingers. And that would uh, cost us 15 pennies. Or we can bet on the unyielding cook. She peers through the white pieces as if they were bars of a cell. Or we can bet with Greyfields, or we can remain aloof. Betting on chess it just isn't done. Perhaps you, would, you might venture an acerbic remark. Okay, well, I... I Ooh, black or white? I think we'll go on black. We were fortunate. A brilliant soul, wonderful. The butler plays are dangerous. Audacious attacks, throwing black pieces into the cook's rear ranks whilst jousting for control of the center. She responds with slow, relentless counters, lifting her pieces with fingers grown strong from kneading the morning bread. Fortune is with the butler today. A three-move combination opens a fork which claims the cook's rook. She holds on for a few more turns, but the butler slices up her pawn line for mate in four. They share a handshake which speaks of games past and games yet to come. You collect your winnings from a whiskered gentleman, flushed with the thrill of the match. I assume we do it from the season of bargains. Yes, we do. Let's unlock it this that, right there, is the most terrifyingly amazing artwork I have ever seen in this game. Look, he's got a top hat, a chess piece, and a candle. What more do you want? Right, let's, let's unlock it. Unlock the shallows. Uh, anywhere in London, an ill-fated raid. A crack squad of special constables assembles in front of a nondescript door in Childcake Street. One silent gesture, and the leaders swing their hobnailed boots in unison. The door goes in. An explosion rips through the upstairs flat. Glass and brick fragments spray the street. The blast knocks off your f you off your feet and into a nearby wall. Damn, that doesn't sound good. So, we have three options. We can investigate the source of the blast. The building looks far from stable. We can help the wounded constables. Several of them are bleeding out, or we can steal stuff. It's not looting, it's clearing debris. No, I think we're going to help the, co the constables because they are the people who I like the most here. Everybody else in the area seems stunned or confused. You move amongst the officers performing triage. A couple of them are too far gone, and you will have to let neath nature take its course. But you can help the others. You apply a tourniquet, to arrest the bleeding of a mangled leg and settle a concussion case who looks about to wander into the river. Then you start on the head wounds and broken bones. It takes a lot of silk, but by the time the relief squad arrives, your assistance has been noted and appreciated. A hollow-cheeked man takes you aside. From his confidential manner and the faint odour of brass polish, you gather that he is a civil servant. We know you by your reputation, of course. A lucky coincidence that you would be here during this terrible incident. Lucky for us at the Ministry, I mean. Your jacket is quite ruined. Thank you for speaking with me. Here's my card. Do call on me at Ladybones Road as soon as possible. This could be a lucrative opportunity, and time is short. You examine the card as he wanders off. Department of Restful Sleep. Well, this is a new one, and his voice was quite soporific. 
So, we need to go to Lady Burns Road. That is... Is that spite? God damn it, I can never find Lady Burns Road. No, that's Wolf Stop Docks. Probably gone over it three times now. There it is. Ooh, that's a very nice looking townhouse right there. The Department of Restful Sleep. It occupies a quiet wing of a ministry building set well back from the bustle of Lady Bones Road. The corridors are lined with thick carpet of muted swirls. Instead of paintings, the walls display mirrors, every one either covered or chipped. We can meet with our contact. He rises from a desk covered in drawings of the brain. Most good of you to come, my lady. How do you take your tea? Ah, the most British of questions. Hmm. An exotic infusion. The teapot is a standard civil service issue, but the steaming tea he pours is quite unusual. You catch notes of camella and valerian root. Does the liquid have a slight blue shimmer? Our own blend. Surface leaves and some hush hush sublitly performed on the Carnelian coast. No idea what. Still, you can drink it right before bedtime. You notice the nameplate on his desk is so outrageously long it has been formed from two normal nameplates. It reads Under Secretary for Hypnogogic Intrusion. Ooh. How intriguing. So we should probably Ask him what he wants. It's odd to approach someone at an explosion, and civil servants rarely get straight to the point. The Undersecretary sips his tea and studies you. The raid you witnessed was to interrogate a cell of anarchists. We've been trying to identify their controller for some months, but they let off their own bombs rather than be captured. That's dedication, hmm? So now we need to extract that information in another way. The force of the blast ripped apart the building. He must mean to extract the information from other anarchists. He gives you a long look. Not exactly, he says. So, who are these anarchists? The Undersecretary slides a file from beneath the drawings. Three of them, we think. The first is the technician, an engineer we believe to have been radicalized by his father. The second is a philosopher, an earnest while colleague of Dr. Slomo, and an expert of the unconscious mind. The third is the enforcer, a retired banker who appears to have used his financial contacts to fund their activities. A tough egg, that last one. So what's the connection between sleep and these revolutionaries. We think this particular cell was working on methods to influence dreams, specifically to induce nightmares. He raises a hand. I know it sounds far-fetched, but our dreams affect our behavior more than most people realize. Even when we don't consciously retain them, the memories are there, buried, and they influence our perceptions. An instinctive distrust of a stranger, a horror of a particular food, even he catches a stray drop of tea with the saucer and pours it back into his cup. Even political decisions. So what is your plan? Our targets could still be intercepted. He lets the word hang there. Normally, we'd take the corpse into custody and wait for them to wake up. But this time, we can't even tell which pieces belong to which body. He sucks tea. They aren't coming back. We need someone to pursue them beyond death itself. Melodramatic, I know. But I can't ask any of my people to do it. Contractual issues. It's definitely a job for a skilled independent. He sits there quietly. You clarify that he expects this skilled independent to die in order to get the job done. It seems the only way, he says. So that seems like a terrible idea. Are we... <laughs> We can either accept death holds no fear for you, or we can decline. This doesn't mean you won't do it. You just won't do it for him. <laughs> I, I don't, whatever. 
that I know for a fact that you can't properly die in here as long as, long as, as, long as we don't get blown into little pieces and a quick tap on the back of the head or something, you know, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Death holds no fear. I mean, there is the small problem. But, uh, you die, you get stuck down here forever. At least that's kind of the conventional take on the law, I think. I mean, it's a bit of a muddy subject, but if you die, you definitely can't leave. You definitely die again if you go to the surface. Something like that, anyway. The Undersecretary nods. Capital, as I understand it. Time works differently there. The, ah, uh, psychic shock of being blown up may delay your targets and allow you to reach the river first. How you handle things there is up to you. But don't let the boatman take them all the way. He rises with you and nods in funeral commiseration. We'll recover your body, of course, and look after it. There is a substantial fee. Hey, we have to progress the story, we have to die. Oh. <laughs> that was... <laughs> my brain was like, how can I hurt myself? I mean, I could go to the fighting club and fight till my wounds get high enough and then I die. Or we could just click this card here that's just la aptly labelled, die. If it were done, when tis done, then twere well, it were done quickly. My thoughts, exactly. Go out in style. A notorious cat burglar thinks he can get you to the top of one of Bazaar's spires. You can take the quick route back down. Oh, or we can go out fighting. There's an entire pub of violent reprobates you've been meaning to have a word with. Uh, and we can leave? If we had an amulet? What is this? You need a horse head amulet. Hmm, do they stop you from dying? Something to do with the fourth city, I imagine, if it's horse heads. But, uh, I mean... Jumping off of the bazaar to commit suicide, there's a, there's a poetic justice to that. But then on the other hand, I'd quite like to go... <laughs> have a fight with some violent reprobates. <laughs> the lamb and flagellants has a unique reputation in Vale Garden. Its beer and gin are entirely unremarkable. The customers select it for the unrivaled air of menace which permeates its dirty public rooms. Last year, it avoided bankruptcy by introducing a penny deposit scheme for glasses and announcing that the pocket change of unconscious combatants was fair game for the bar staff. No elaborate plan is necessary. You kick the doors open, seize two full pint glasses from separate tables, and smash them over the heads of random villains from two other groups. The resulting fracas is mercifully brief. Oh, but at least we got some brandy. We did, however, go from zero wounds to dead in one fight, so that's pretty impressive. A sudden darkness. Your wounds have proven too much for you. You collapse. It's like going to sleep. If going to sleep really hurt. I just want to say, I think this is the first time I've ever died in Fallen London. I've been playing this game for a long time and I've always managed to avoid dying. I've been sent to the crazy house and I've been sent to the tomb colonies more than once. But I don't think I've ever died. Uh, go gently into that good night. Don't panic. There are ways to recover. You will, however, lose any iron knife tokens you may possess. I don't know what that means. This is the river, yet not the stolen river. Here is a boatman, yet not the lighterman you know from London. You've been here before. You've moved to a new area, a slow boat passing a dark beach on a silent river. Well, here is the story, approach the boatman. Lantern light ripples on waters and the timbers. Punched, he awaits in the boat, timeless and patient, patient, watching you with empty eye sockets. The boatman is the only one who spends time with the newly deceased. Could this be an opportunity you need to learn about the dead revolutionaries? We can ask him for his cooperation using our melancholy skill, but that only gives us 60% chance Otherwise, we could pay with a penny, a lump of wax, and a soul. You've heard he demands three tokens of luck, duty, and loss. We could remind him of chess, but I don't think we are the boatman's opponent. So let's just pay him. It's the easiest way. I don't want to fail. 
You place the objects into his palm one by one. Skeletal fingers curl around them and slip them into the shadows of his coat. Poultry, he says, but acceptable tokens. The boat bobs, bumping the sands. The boatman seems unmoved. You need to do something more here. Oh, okay, so my, uh... My payment wasn't enough. Well, maybe... Maybe we will try, we'll... Oh god, failure will impact your melancholy. Uh, what's sixty percent chance? Let's roll those dice. Damn it! You leave out the greater context. Just explain that there are three people coming this way that you would like to interview, and he is the key figure to make it happen. Perhaps he could, for instance, arrive a little late to pick them up. Dry air shifts inside his navel cavity. Is that a sniff? What did it mean? Because that didn't work. Let's try. Try again. Failed again. Wonderful. Uh, 70% chance. Let's go. No. Let's pay him again. Okay, so we can offer <laughs> to mine the oars for a time. The boatman isn't one to soften towards a person. But at least now, perhaps he'll consider the proposal. It will give you a chance to spend time with each dead revolutionary, and the boatman is surely overdue for a holiday. That skull looks directly at you. Those finger bones beckon you forward. Into your left hand he places his lantern, a solitary candle burning within. Into your right hand he places his oar, scratched but formidable. He steps out of the boat, unsteady on land, then rotates to stare at you for a while, almost as an afterthought. He lifts that hat from his head and places it on yours. Nodding, he shuffles away up the bank. That seemed too easy. You settle down to wait for your first customer? The air is still. Nothing moves on the bank. You dip the oar into the water and give it an experimental twist. Ripples spread out and dissipate. Somebody will come before long. You stifle a yawn. You have apparently offered to convey the dead to the far shore. This is going to be interesting, isn't it? You have taken on the mantle of the boatman to the dead you will appear skeletal, sinister, the embodiment of death. We can, the first is the skittish engineer. The first revolutionary stands on the bank, polishing his spectacles and awaiting the ferry. He looks like the type to obsess over the details. The skittish engineer waves his spectacles as you draw the boat up to the bank. Incredible that these passed over with me. I can't tell if they're clean or not. This is all very new. I'm talking too much, aren't I? He steps into the boat, and you push it out into the river. The craft wobbles, and the spectacles slip from the engineer's fingers into the dark water. Oh, he says. Then he blinks and stares ahead. You know, I think my life might be flashing before me. When you concentrate, you share the images he sees. A coat hook, bent schematics, a spilled glass of wine. Is this some power the boatman holds? He stares into the murk, but he is looking through his memories. You find you can examine them with him, as if you were there. So, we can disassemble a clock. It sits there, on the mantelpiece, inside a glass dome. Beneath it, an arrangement of four brass balls rotates, first one way, then the other. My parents had a clock like that. Very, um, very interesting design. Let's try it. You stretch up to lift off the dome, then carry the mechanism to the dining table. The second hand ticks, unconcerned. 
You examine the clock from every angle. Why do the balls change direction? When you hear the door open, you have gears and screws strewn across the table. The clock stopped ticking an hour ago. You feel on the verge of understanding. But as you stare at your father's darkening face, your scientific curiosity is replaced by dread. It is a long night upstairs with no supper. In your mind, the balls oscillate left, then right. We can play chess with your father. He must have gotten better because now he wins sometimes. Your father supports his chin with his palm, fingers woven through the black curls of his beard. He watches you jump the night over piece after piece, just like drafts, but moving in an L shape. Really good players only move once on their turn, he says. You think about this. You would like to be a really good player, but jumping the horse around is fun. Jump, 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 jump. We could uh, solve a problem for school, a hundred lines, that would take all night. Wait, I must not release bats during algebra. <laughs> you cobble together ten pens and fix them in a rack, so that you can write ten lines in one go. By using small springs as separators, you can get discernible variations in the writing, enough to make it look like you did it ten times. The work, but not enough to have you pulled up for some shoddy penmanship. It feels good to have found a creative solution to an undeserved punishment. Satisfying. We can meet a mysterious contact. The note is not signed, but it gives a time and a place. Recruitment. You arrive alone and wait for 20 minutes. Just when you're about to give up, you are grabbed from behind and subdued. They remove your blindfold in a cold cellar that smells of stale vegetables. A man sits in shadow, his hands steepled. I sincerely apologize for our little dramatics. We hear you have been frustrated lately, even speaking out against masters, although you understand how dangerous that can be, agitating for a popular uprising. So you are to disappear just like your father, you glare at your captor. We could use a man of your talents, he says. Oh, the engineer has returned to the present for a moment. This could be your opportunity to extract information. Who was it? The subject of his controller. The engineer avoids your gaze, afraid to look at the face beneath that old battered hat. His voice sounds thin in the river air. I joined up because I thought we should determine our own fate. We should take action to resist the control of the masters, to break the authority of the special constables. But I never questioned her orders, did I? I just did what I was told. He folds his arms. I swapped one oppressor for another. So we found out the controller is female. Hmm, we are back here again. I guess we can disassemble the clock again. I'm about to run out of actions, so I may have to end the episode soon. Uh, I made the mistake of playing the game before uh, recording this episode. Uh, save your father from special constables. Hello. Four of them are waiting when you return home. One is holding the old street signs your father kept in the shed. The constables stare as you push in front of your father and raise your fists. Each of them is at least a head taller than you, but your boxing lessons are fresh in your mind, and your blood is up. Don't, your father yells, as one constable steps forward. You faint at his face, then land a solid smash into his midriff. He falls back, gasping, as you square up to the other three. Your moment of glory lasts another five seconds. Your mother finds you unconscious on the doorstep, covered in blood. They never bring back your father. So, I think I'm going to have to end the episode here. It's been about half an hour anyway, but this is a very interesting, exceptional story. We are playing the Boatman. That seems like a very prestigious role. And we seem to be researching some sort of revolutionary cell. So I'm very interested to see where this is go going. 
then please like, subscribe, let me know what you think. Your comments are greatly appreciated. And as always, I'll see you next time.